Three new very long and difficult Beethoven quartets are attracting the attention of all connoisseurs. They are profoundly thought through and admirably worked out, but not to be grasped by all. It is 1807 and these words appear in the Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung, the most important music publication of the time. The quartets referenced are the Opus 59s and the first one in the set, Opus 59 number one, truly is very long and profoundly thought through. Only six years have passed since Beethoven finished his Opus 18 quartets, but something has happened during this time and his development has accelerated. He is now fully emboldened and thinking big. We are now in his middle period and some of his most iconic works have just been finished. The third and fourth piano concertos, the Tempest, Waldstein, and Appassionata piano sonatas, and even his third symphony, the Eroica symphony. This is Beethoven, the revolutionary. There are two things that I want to point out about these quartets. Number one, they were commissioned by Count Andreas Razumovsky, Russia's ambassador to Vienna. And Razumovsky had the idea to request that each of the Opus 59 quartets contain somewhere a Russian theme. The second thing is that Razumovsky, bless his heart, decided to employ a full-time string quartet led by Ignaz Schupanzig. This probably is the first professional string quartet that we know of. And the fact that Beethoven had access to this sort of changed the game. He suddenly had a quartet that he could work with that consistently played at a high level and with the same personnel. Essentially, Beethoven was writing for all-stars, and I'm pretty sure that's why these quartets are considered some of the most difficult to play. The opening of Opus 59-1 is unassuming, but will make you smile. The form in all of these movements are massive, and in 59-1, Beethoven is notoriously messing with conventions. Let's check out what he does with the end of the exposition. Classic exposition repeat, right? Wrong. Or even the transition back to the recap where the first violin spirals into the ether to a high B flat, creeping up to a B natural. Surely we will now go to a C, which would be the perfect transition back to F major, except no, he throws us a curveball using the opening material and lands on a fully diminished seventh chord, a chord that really can go anywhere. And then finally he takes us home gloriously. Where one would expect a slow movement to follow, Beethoven goes with a scherzo. A scherzo that is a maze, a labyrinth of themes, modulations, and shifts of moods. Its form is a conundrum. It is a Rubik's Cube that cannot be solved. Is it sonata form, sonata rondo form, or some sort of fusion of scherzo trio and sonata form? The fact that over 200 years later, we still can't figure out Beethoven's logic for this scherzo is just mind boggling. Beethoven opens with a tactic he is well known for, distilling a motive almost completely into just rhythm. Think about Beethoven's fifth. <laughs> Here he has the cello repeat a B flat no less than 15 times. This is followed by a movement filled to the brim with themes like this. This. And this. Oh yeah, and remember that first theme? He eventually throws a complete tantrum over it.
Every instance of Mesto used in music that I know of stands out as a deeply moving moment. Mesto means sad in Italian. Brahms used it in his horn trio and Bartok famously used it in his sixth string quartet. Here is the Mesto from 59-1. This is music of private grief, music that is so intensely intimate and personal, it completely draws you in. On the last leaf of sketches of this adagio, Beethoven wrote, a weeping willow or acacia tree over my brother's grave. One of the most transformative moments comes in the D-flat major section. So what happened to that Russian theme? Well, after a long winding cadenza, the first violin eventually lands on a trill and a Russian folk song magically appears in the cello. This movement is full of that brusque Beethovenian energy. It's daring, virtuosic fun. At the very end of this long journey, he finds a moment of repose, a brief adagio that makes us wonder if maybe he's being a tad melodramatic. And then, a presto that races to the end. 